Hi friends, have you heard about a, a disease called 3-day measles? Then 10-day measles. Then what is the difference between these 3-day measles and 10-day measles? So those things will be explained in this session. And uh, once again, I am welcoming you all back to our channel, the Nurse Channel. And uh, as you all know, we have started our uh, Nurse Norset series, and this is the sixth series. And uh, whoever didn't watch the old series, kindly uh, watch those videos. And um, once again, uh, I request everyone who are watching this video to watch the video till the end and uh, kindly subscribe and support us. So as I told in the beginning, this is the sixth series of questions which contains. 15 important questions which are taken from different areas of nursing subjects and these questions with uh, explanation will definitely help you to prepare for the upcoming NOSET examination. So watch this video till the end without skipping and straight away we will move on to the questions. So the first question in our series is uh, right now in your screen and the question uh, is from uh, Andy TB Trucks okay regarding the TB Trucks. The question is which among the following anti-TB drugs is autotoxic? Okay, so the question is which among the following anti-TB drugs is autotoxic? Okay, autotoxicity is the side effect of which anti-tubercular drug? So the options are first is INH, option number B rifampicin, option number C pyrazinamide and option number D streptomycin. So among this which drug is autotoxic or can cause hearing impairment that is the question so what is the answer it's a very very important question so the answer is option number d that is streptomycin so we know that streptomycin belongs to aminoglycoside group of antibiotics right so aminoglycoside antibiotics like streptomycin canamycin gentamicin tobramycin and neomycin they can lead to hearing loss that means these are autotoxic drugs okay so while giving medicines for the patients we should be careful and uh, we should understand the other important side effects of the other anti-tubercular drugs what i have given in the options okay so first option was inh so inh can happen pellagra like symptoms okay pellagra like symptoms is a side effect of inh okay there are so many other side effects also but whatever important for the exam point of view i am explaining here okay in the short form then next one is the rifampicin you know that rifampicin patients taking rifampicin will have orange um, discoloration in the urine and uh, uh, that uh, even sometimes in the sweat also okay so rifampicin that orange color discoloration will be there in the body fluids then uh, pyrazinamide gout like features okay arthritic features can be seen in patients taking pyrazinamide then etampular another anti-tubercular drug and uh, it can cause ocular manifestations like uh, retrobulbar neuritis okay so these are the other uh, uh, anti-tubercular drugs and its major side effects okay there are uh, uh, once again i am telling you there are other so many side effects but in exam point of view whatever it is important that i have shown to you okay so that's all regarding the first question now we will move on to the second question it is a picture based question and the, uh, and your uh, task is to identify the poster okay so this is a poster uh, right now you can see in the screen so identify this poster okay so what poster the patient is uh, is lying down so the options are first one is decorticate position second one is a decerebrate poster third one is that patient is in dystonia and the final option is the patient is in opisthotonus so what is this poster called so whoever working in the ICU and all can uh, answer this question very easily so you know that the answer for this question is option number B that is a decerebrate posturing okay so these things we are uh, we have to see in a neurological impaired patients and uh, you have to go for the GCS assessment okay so in that the uh, motor assessment we, we will be knowing about the decerebrate posturing decorticate posturing uh, flexion withdrawal and uh, abnormal extension all those things okay so I will be explaining here what is a decerebrate posturing right now so you can see the picture of a decerebrate person here and this posturing is also called as the extensor posturing okay and it describes the involuntary extension of the upper extremities in response to external stimuli okay so whenever we are giving a painless stimuli pain st painful stimuli over the sternal area or over the uh, on the forehead we can see the patient will be like a de in the decerebrating position the patient's head and neck will be arched out okay it will be arched out legs will be straight and completely extended you can see here and uh, the toes are pointed downwards and again if you are seeing the arms you can see it is straight 
it is extended and the hands are curled okay so diesel bed posturing the head is arched back the arms are extended by the sides and the legs are extended okay <clears throat> so this is the uh, uh, classical uh, uh, presentation of decerebrate posturing so now we have to understand what is decorticate okay so decorticate post posturing this is the position uh, of the patient in the decorticate posturing and here the patient presents with the arms flexed you can see the um, uh, hands are closed hands are flexed arms are abducted attracted and flexed against the chest and legs are internally rotated you can see here the legs are internally rotated and the feet are turned and inward okay so uh, here arms are flexed or bent towards on the chest the hands are clenched into the feet and the legs extended and the feet turn inward okay so this is a decorticate posturing okay the first one was the decerebrate posturing second one is the decorticate posturing and uh, another option was the opisthotonus so uh, opisthotonus means the patient will be um, will present like a bow you can see here opisthotonus it is defined as a dramatic abnormal posture due to the spastic contraction of the extensor muscles of the neck trunk and lower extremities that produces a severe backward arching from neck to heel you can see that the, the pakka arching you can see from neck to heel okay so this is because of the spastic contraction of the extensor muscles of the neck of the trunk and the lower extremities okay so one more additional information this uh, opisthotonus can be a symptom of several different health conditions which includes infections such as tetanus rabies encephalitis meningitis malaria syphilis etc okay so this is this is the opisthotonus posture posturing okay so i think you, you understood this and one more option what i have given was the dystonia okay so this is will be um, this is an example for the uh, focal dystonia okay so i'll explain what is focal dystonia so dystonia it is a movement disorder that causes the muscles to contract involuntary okay so involuntary contraction of the muscle happens in dystonia and this can cause a uh, twisting movements okay and uh, this condition can affect only one part of your body that is known as the focal dystonia then two or more adjacent parts then it is known as the segmental dystonia and if it affects the whole body means it is known as the general dystonia okay so dystonia is the involuntary contraction of the muscles okay so i think you understood about the three um, uh, types of dystonia also okay so with one question you are getting a bunch of information now we will move on to the third question in our series the third very 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 important important question which type of seizure is called as petit mal seizure okay so the question is very simple and very direct which type of seizure is called as petit mal seizure and the options are absent seizure option b atonic seizure option c myoclonic seizure and option d tonic and clonic seizure so which type of which seizure is called as the petit mal seizures so what are options i have given are part of uh, generalized seizures so <clears throat> find out which is known as the petit mal seizure definitely answer is option number a that is absent seizure is otherwise known as the petit mal seizure so we will have a small explanation regarding this question absent seizures are otherwise known as the petit mal seizures are characterized by a brief period of a brief loss and return of consciousness generally not followed by a period of lethargy that means not there will not be a notable post ictal state okay so that is the absence seizures here a b period of loss of consciousness will be there and a patient will return the consciousness generally not followed by a period of lethargy okay so that is known as the absence seizure then we will see the other options also so what is a myoclonic seizure or the myoclonus so it is a brief involuntary irregular lacking rhythm okay irregular means lacking rhythm twitching of the muscles or a group of muscles and it is different from the clonic seizures that is myoclonus means it is rhythmic and regular okay myoclonus means it is a brief involuntary irregular twitching of the muscles whereas clonic means it will be rhythmic and regular that we will see in the next slide that is the clonus clonus it is a set of involuntary and rhythmic muscular contractions and relaxations okay so together if it comes then we termed it as the generalized tonic clonic seizures we are otherwise called as the gtcs or it was known previously as the grand mal seizures okay so petit mal is absent seizures grand mal is the generalized tonic clonic seizure it is a type of generalized seizure that produces bilateral 
convulsive tonic and then chronic muscle contractions okay first tonicity will be there then chronic muscle contractions we can see okay so that is gtcs okay so the question was regarding petit mal that is absent seizure grand mal that is tonic clonic seizures and along with that we have explained about the myoclonic seizures and the clonic seizures okay so i think that is clear for you now now we will move on to the next question in our series that is the fourth fourth question and uh, this is also very very important and the question is the most common cause of death from refeeding syndrome is so first of all you should understand what is a refeeding syndrome so first we will discuss about the answer for this question the options for the question and the options are first one is hemorrhage the second option is arrhythmias the third option is stroke and the final option is hypoglycemia okay so the most common cause of death from refeeding syndrome is so what is the answer <clears throat> so the answer is option number b that is arrhythmias arrhythmias are the common reason for death occurring because of refeeding syndrome so first of all we should understand what is the refeeding syndrome so we know that refeeding syndrome it is a metabolic disturbances that occurs as a result of reinstitution of nutrition in people and animals who are starved severely malnourished or metabolically stressed because of severe illness okay so for example uh, if the patient was severely ill for a long period of time and the patient was not taken adequate food and if the patient is malnourished and then patient was introduced to new foods like you know, introduced with the uh, nutrition again that patient can result in some metabolic disturbances which is known as the refeeding syndrome okay so there are so many pathophysiology for this process because during the starvation time that uh, uh, everything will be less that uh, insulin production then um, uh, metabolism everything will be less so when we are introducing when we are introducing food to the patient or in a large quantity then there occurs some metabolic disturbances that can result in the electrolyte imbalances like hypokalemia and all and this hypokalemia and other things that can result in the development of cardiac abnormalities like arrhythmias and other complications okay so we can we know that the abnormal heart rhythms or the arrhythmias are the most common cause of death from refeeding syndrome with other significant risk which includes confusion coma convulsions and cardiac failure okay so mainly because of the hypokalemia these things are happening okay okay so refeeding syndrome you can refer little more if you want to clear your um, uh, if you want to get more information okay so that is a refeeding syndrome now we will uh, uh, discuss about the next question in the series that is the fifth question the question is the most commonest extra pulmonary manifestation of tb is so the question is the commonest extra pulmonary manifestation of tb okay extra pulmonary tb so the options are first one is the ovarian tb the second one is the gastric tb then the third option is the port spine and the final option is the tb meningitis so which is the commonest extra pulmonary manifestation of tb so option number c that is a port spine or the spinal tb is the example is a commonest extra uh, pulmonary manifestation of tb so this is the picture of a patient having the spinal tb you can see some bumps here some abnormal uh, of the spine here so spinal tuberculosis or the port spine is the commonest extra pulmonary manifestation of tb and clinically it presents with constitutional symptoms like back pain tenderness paraplegia sometimes paraparesis and kyphotic or scoliotic deformities okay kyphotic or scoliotic deformities okay so this is the most common extra pulmonary manifestation of tb that is a spinal tuberculosis or port spine okay clear <clears throat> now uh, we will move on to the sixth question in our series uh, so this is regarding the total parental nutrition the question is how frequently infusion sets to be changed for a patient receiving total parental nutrition or tpn so how frequently you will change the set of patient receiving total parental nutrition that is a uh, question for you and the options are option a 12 hours option b 48 hours option c 72 hours and final option number d 24 hours so how frequently you will change the sets of a patient uh, patient receiving total parental nutrition so what is the answer so it should be removed every 24 hours okay it should be replaced every 24 hours so we know that uh, the fresh blood products and lipid containing solutions like uh, tp and andol both the bag syringe the giving set and the lines should be removed or changed 
at conclusion of conclusion of the infusion or at least every 24 hours okay at the conclusion of the uh, this one or at least every 24 hours we should change the uh, this one what uh, 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 sets of the patient receiving uh, uh, total parental nutrition so moving on to the uh, seventh question in our series and the seventh question is right now in your screen question is uh, the which position do you place the place patient for thoracentesis so the question is regarding a position which position do you place the patient for thoracentesis easy question so the options are first option high fowler's position second option semi fowler's position third option orthopnic position and final option sideline position so in which position do you place the patient for a thoracentesis procedure so what is the answer think about the thoracentesis what is thoracentesis and uh, how it is performed then you can answer this question very easily so the answer for this question is option number c that is orthopnic position we have to keep the patient in orthopnic position so first of all we will see what is a thoracentesis it is also known as the pleural tap or the needle thoracostomy or needle decompression it is an invasive medical procedure to remove the fluid or air from the pleural space for diagnostic or therapeutic purpose pleural space and all you know that the uh, that uh, covering of the lungs you know that there is a space okay uh, so thoracentesis is, uh, uh, is the pleural type otherwise known as a needle thoracostomy it is a procedure to remove the fluid or air from the pleural space okay so uh, this is the uh, orthopnic position where we have to keep the patient this is the position in which a person sits upright so patient is sitting in a bed possibly bending forward okay so patient has to bend forward so lateral recommend position or the supine position can be used if the patient um, limited to patients unable to sit if the patient is not able to sit then we can give lateral recommend position or supine position okay so orthopnic position is the best position uh, for the procedure of thoracic synthesis okay so i think that question also is clear for you now we will move on to the eighth question in our series though this is from the central nervous system question is the net pressure gradient causing cerebral blood flow to the brain is termed as so question the net pressure gradient causing cerebral blood flow to the brain is termed as so the options are option number a icp option number b map option number c cpp option number d iop so expand it and answer the following answer the question net pressure gradient causing cerebral blood flow so what is the answer simple question direct question and the answer is option number c that is cpp or cerebral perfusion pressure so we will see that cerebral perfusion pressure or cpp it is a net pressure gradient causing cerebral blood flow to the brain so how we can calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure so there is a formula is there it is a difference between the mean arterial pressure that is map and the intracranial pressure so mean arterial pressure is map minus icp we will get cerebral perfusion pressure okay and it is measured in millimeters of mercury millimeter mercury so normal cpp is around 60 to 80 millimeter mercury okay 60 to 80 millimeter mercury is a normal cpp so the other options you know very well that is a intracranial pressure or icp it is the pressure exerted by the fluid such as cerebrospinal fluid inside the skull and on the brain tissues and a normal uh, icp is 7 to 15 millimeters of mercury and uh, another option was the mean arterial pressure or the map it is the average arterial pressure throughout one cardiac cycle that is means in a systole and a diastole so the average arterial pressure is known as the mean arterial pressure in a cardiac cycle and normal is between 65 and 110 okay so there is a uh, a formula for the mean arterial pressure it is the diastolic pressure plus one third of pulse pressure okay diastolic pressure plus one third of pulse pressure and pulse pressure you know that it is the difference between the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure okay so this is the formula for the mean arterial pressure or the map and the normal lies between 65 to 110 millimeters of mercury okay so i think 
that is clear now another option was the iop that is the intraocular pressure that is not related to any of the other options it is the fluid pressure inside the eyes okay and the normal intraocular pressure is 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury and this iop will be increased in a condition called glaucoma okay so these are some additional information so intraocular pressure normally is 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury so with one question you are getting information about the normal icp normal cpp normal uh, mean arterial pressure and what is an intra uh, 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 ocular pressure okay so i think that question is clear for you now we will move on to the ninth question in our series the question is in the screen right now it is from the community health nursing question is which among the following disease is not transmitted by droplet so question is very simple which among the following disease is not transmitted by droplet so the options are first one is mumps option number b rubella uh, third option number C rubiola and the final option number D typhoid so which which among these following disease is not transmitted by uh, droplet infection droplet transmission so what is the answer very simple question answer is option number D that is typhoid you know typhoid how it is transmitting so you know that mumps it is a contagious and infectious viral disease which causing swelling of the parotid salivary gland in the face and a risk for the sterility in adult males and the mode of transmission is person to person through the respiratory droplets as well as through the direct contact with the saliva of an infected person okay so mumps is clear now rubella rubella is otherwise known as a cunt is a um, otherwise known as german measles or three day measles okay german measles or three day measles and it is a contagious viral infection that's known by its distinctive red rash okay and rubella is transmitted is also transmitted primarily through the direct or droplet contact from the nasopharyngeal secretions okay so rubella otherwise known as the german measles otherwise known as the three day measles okay then what is rubiola rubiola is otherwise known as the 10 day measles okay this is because of the development and the so, and uh, uh, the um, uh, the progress of the disease and uh, the disease will subside within like uh, some 10 days or within 3 days like, like, that's why it is named as the 10 day measles or the 3 day measles for uh, rubiola as the 10 day measles and the rubella as the 3 day measles etc okay so it is otherwise known as the red measles or the pakka measles it is a viral illness that results in a viral exanthem exanthem is a type of skin rash and measles is transmitted from person to person primarily by the airborne route as aerosolized droplet nuclei okay so rubiola also is transmitted by droplet transmission and the final option was the answer for our question was the typhoid and it is an infection that spreads through the contaminated food and water okay that is uh, the causative organism is the salmonella typhi okay typhoid fever through contaminated food and water okay so the answer for our question is typhoid it's a simple question uh, now we will move on to <coughs> the 10th question in our series the question also this is also related to vaccine from community health nursing which is the correct combination in pentavalent vaccine okay so the question is pentavalent vaccine consists of which old vaccines okay and the options are first option uh, dpt hepatitis b hib hib vaccine Option number B, DCG, Hepatitis B, HIB, HIB vaccine. Option number C, DPT, OPV, HIB. And the final option is DPT, Hepatitis B, measles. So, which is the correct combination in pentavalent vaccine? So, don't be confused. So, what is the answer? Pentavalent. So, the answer is option number A, DPT, Hepatitis B and uh, hemophilus influenza vaccine okay Influ hemophilus influenza b type so pentavalent vaccine provides protection to a child from five life threatening diseases like diphtheria pertussis tetanus that is dpt then hepatitis b and hemophilus influenza type b okay so and the schedule is like 6th 10th and 14th weeks okay 6th 10th and 14 weeks this is a pentavalent vaccine schedule and a pentavalent vaccine combination okay so i think that is a very informative question and it's a very very important question now we will move on to the 11th question and this is a tricky uh, application level question you have to identify the old one okay so i have i am giving you some options from this options you have to find out the old one so the options are option number a normal saline 0.9 percent saline option number b ringer lactate then option number c half normal saline that is 0.45 percent 
and final option is 5% dextrose in water. So from this you have to identify the old one. So that is a question for you. So just to think about the tonicity of the uh, solutions what I have given in the option and you can answer this question very very easily. So what is the answer? So obviously the option answer is option number C that is a half normal saline or 0.45%. So you know that these solutions these are isotonic solutions or all options are isotonic solution except the C that is a half normal saline is a hypotonic solution. Okay. So that is a um, uh, that's how that uh, that uh, option number C become the odd one. Okay, so we know that 0.45 sal percent saline or the 0.45 saline is um, half saline is a hypertonic solution. And uh, examples of the isotonic solutions are what we have given in the option like a normal saline, then a lactated ringer solution, 5% dextrose in water, and a ringer solution or ringer lactate solution. Everything is same. And uh, you should uh, understand one thing that. Um, dextrose 5 percent in water no this d 5 w it starts as an isotonic solution okay when we are administering it it will be uh, act as an isotonic solution and it will be changed to hypotonic solution when the dextrose is metabolized when the dextrose is getting uh, after metabolizing it will act as a hypotonic solution and when we are administering it will be administered as an isotonic solution okay so that is a peculiarity of d 5 w or 5 percent dextrose in water okay so i think that was a tricky easy uh, application level question now we will We'll move on to um, the 12th question in our series and the question is now regarding the rule of nine burns calculation the question is according to rule of nine total percent in both entire legs is so question you should be very careful very you should read very cl clearly according to rule of nine total percent in both entire legs the question is regarding both entire legs so don't um, make mistake so the uh, options are option number A 9%, option number B 18%, option number C 36%, then option number D 1%. So the question is regarding both entire leg. So what is the answer? <clears throat> answer is definitely option number C that is 36%. Okay. So we will see the rule of 9. So how we will calculate. So this is a um, this is a posterior aspect of the body and this is the anterior aspect of the body. So in this you can see the head head we can give uh, the in both anterior and posterior 9%. That is posterior 4 and half, uh, anterior 4 and half. Okay. So head constitute 9%, then head and neck. Okay. Then chest anterior chest to constitute 9% and the posterior chest to constitute 9% okay so total 18% both uh, both anterior and posterior chest then abdomen for anterior abdomen it will be like 9% and the posterior part it will be 9% so this also total will be 18% okay anterior and posterior trunk will be 18% then coming to the hands anterior part it is uh, 4 and half and uh, right and left it will be nine percent and posterior also it will be nine percent so hands together it will be how much it will be there this nine uh, four and a half plus four and a half nine and four and a half plus four and a half nine in the anterior and the posterior so total 18 both hands constitute 18 both anterior and posterior then the genital will be considered as one percent okay so our question was regarding the entire both legs okay so anterior aspect of the leg can be uh, given a score of nine nine percent both legs it will be 18 percent and posterior part also nine percent e in each leg so that will constitute again 18 percent so 18 percent plus 18 percent total it will be 36 percent so the question was not regarding a single leg it is regarding both the legs that is entire leg that means both the anterior part and the posterior part so question you should be very careful okay this is a tricky question actually so both the lower limbs entire lower limbs it will be 36 percent if the question was regarding uh, hands both hands means how much it will be both hands both hands means it will be like uh, uh, we know that nine uh, for one uh, one hand nine for the other hand both anterior and the posterior it will be 18 only okay so uh, don't be confused head and neck will be nine percent and uh, chest will be 18 percent both anterior and posterior and the abdominal part will be 18 percent both anterior and posterior total okay so i think rule of nine is clear with the single question i believe so now we will move on to 
the next question in our series that is the 13th question and this is regarding immunoglobulin another little confusing question question is which among the following is the smallest immunoglobulin in human body so the question you should be very careful so the, here the key point is smallest which is the smallest immunoglobulin in human body the question is not regarding which is the least immunoglobulin okay the question is regarding the size of the immunoglobulin that means which is the smallest and the options are option number a igm option number b igg option number c ige and option number d igb so which is the smallest which is the smallest so the answer is option number b that is igg okay so there are some peculiarities for all the um, immunoglobulins that we will have a, uh, a capsule uh, a capsule form of all immunoglobulins so igg you know that uh, already we have explained that this is, this is this is the smallest of the among the um, immunoglobulins and it is the most common okay so this is the most common immunoglobulin that is found in the human body and uh, it can cross the placenta okay this is the only um, uh, immunoglobulin that can cross the placenta igg okay so three main information regarding igg which is this is the smallest most common and can cross the placenta then another is the igm so so IgM is the largest so size wise this is the largest one and it is the one which appears first in an infection so if a patient is getting infected the first immunoglobulin to appear is the IgM okay so two information regarding IgM then another option was the uh, IgE so IgE is the allergic immunoglobulin okay this will be high in uh, allergic patients then uh, IgD so this IgD is a small amounts IgD can be seen in the small amounts in the tissues which lines the belly and the chest okay so this is found in very small amounts okay IgD and uh, one more IgA so IgA is an immunoglobulin that is found in the breast milk okay so uh, all these options what I have explained here is very 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 important okay so I am not uh, uh, explaining it further. I think that is clear for you. That was a very, very important question. Now we will move on to the second last question in our series. And this is a general, uh, you should understand about this question. So um, psychotropic drugs are categorized in which schedule of drugs in India? Schedule means you, have, you can see in the uh, tablets uh, cover and all uh, like uh, schedule H drug, schedule X drug. So, with the prescription of the doctor like that. So, in India, the drugs are categorized under some schedules. Okay. So, in which schedule you can find psychotropic drugs? Okay. That's a question for you. And the option are, options are option number A, schedule H, option number B, schedule X, option number C, schedule G, and option number D, schedule Y. So, in which category you can see psychotropic drugs? guidelines regarding psychotropic drugs so you can see it in schedule x option number b schedule x so we will have a small explanation regarding this question so in many of the medicines you can see schedule h that means a prescription is required okay so it, this medicine will be sold under the prescription of a registered medical practitioner okay prescription required medicines are categorized under schedule h then schedule h consists of psychotropic drugs which need special license for manufacture and sale okay psychotropic drugs need special license for manufacture and sale then schedule g is the uh, this group of drugs does not require a prescription but the a label named caution label is mandatory okay caution label is mandatory but there is no need for the prescription for distributing uh, for giving these medicines from a pharmacy that is schedule g drugs then what is schedule y this schedule why it deals with the clinical trials import and manufacturing of new drugs okay that is schedule why okay some other schedules are also there that you can refer later okay so the question answer for our question is schedule x psychotropic drugs okay so i think uh, this is also uh, this is also a new information for you i think so so now we will move on to the last question in our series and the question is which medicine infusion set to be changed every six hours okay so uh, whoever working in the ICUs can answer this question. So why we have to change also that we will explain in the explanation for this question. And the options are first option propofol, option number B binazolam, option number C vecuronium, option number D atracurium. So which medicine infusion set need to be changed every six hours? 
so um, uh, other infusion sites need to be changed whenever it is soiled or uh, it is mixed with the blood or uh, uh, we have to discard uh, every 24 hours okay so uh, usually but some medicines one of the medicine in this option need to be changed every six hours which is that medicine and the answer is option number a that is propofol why so that we will see you know that propofol it is mixed in a liquid containing soybean oil and a substance called egg lecithin okay so egg lecithin is containing in the propofol mixture and uh, this egg lecithin if we keep it for a longer period of time it can cause bacterial growth in that and can result in the development of infection so to prevent bacterial growth propofol infusion sets need to be changed every six hours okay so what is the reason you understood now propofol is mixed with the liquid that is containing soybean oil oil and egg lecithin it's a substance that can get a rotten or it can get contaminated very fast so every six hours we need to change the sets of uh, uh, sets of patient receiving proper fall okay so i think uh, uh, we are coming to the end of this section so once again thank you all thank you all for watching the video till the end so these all 15 questions any doubts any any doubts regarding these questions you are free to ask and um, once again thanking you all uh, for uh, watching the video so kindly keep in touch and uh, stay tuned we will be coming with the another video very very shortly so see you soon till that time uh, signing out